Okay, so we're done with ultrasound, you'll be glad to hear, and we're going to kind of move on to something even more complex. And Dr. Eric Yang, who recently kind of joined the group over here, is going to talk about cardiac MRI. <coughs> Eric. <coughs> Welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the applications of uh, cardiac MRI for cardiovascular interventions. These are my disclosures. And I'm going to talk about um, various cases looking at the use of cardiac MRI in, in inter cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular interventions. These include uh, assessing myocardial viability, valvular regurgitation and leaks, um, applications to congenital heart disease, MRA and severe chronic renal insufficiency, endovascular leaks, dynamic obstructions and aortic sections, and then move on to some future directions, some uh, future work that we're collaborating with uh, various other institutions in doing. But a brief word, I know there's some interest in uh, hybrid ORs, and uh, I know we're looking into that, and some specialized centers are looking into that as well. But there are quite a few logistics involved in trying to join a, an OR um, with its uh, personnel uh, with, uh, with MRI, uh, and not to mention uh, trying to address the safety issues with, uh, with uh, different devices. So around the turn of the century, um, a group in Northwestern uh, began putting out uh, literature uh, using what's called delayed gadolinium enhancement. So gadolinium is administered to the patient, uh, cine images of the heart are taken, and then uh, uh, um, five, 10 minutes later, uh, delayed imaging is, is uh, performed, which then shows that uh, uh, if you look on the lower pa uh, panel, that there's uh, uh, an area of white rim enhancement following a vascular territory. And it was discovered that this does correlate with, uh, with myocardial infarction and scar tissue. And so uh, this uh, shifts the paradigm of not simply inferring uh, whether or not an ischemic uh, area, um, an infarct area is present, but uh, being able to actually see uh, an area of myocardial infarction uh, using contrast enhanced imaging. This is an example of a patient who uh, came in, uh, was found to have um, what looks like an LED territory lesion. He underwent cabbage and then and you can see how his EF initially was about 30% on the top panel, Cines, and how after revascularization with cabbage, uh, it improved to 50%, demonstrating that this was indeed um, viable tissue. The data that uh, uh, the group in Northwestern uh, put out at the time showed that uh, if you had less than 50% uh, infarct area um, thickness, that a majority of these segments do recover uh, um, on subsequent imaging. Uh, so that came up with the, um, with the thought that Bright is dead based on the delayed enhancement imaging um, uh, uh, concept. But then uh, more recently, our, our director here, um, Dr. Deepan Shah, uh, went ahead and, and uh, also dispelled the notion uh, on ECHO that thin is uh, non-viable. So often we, uh, when we read ECHOs, we see an area that's thinned out and we automatically assume that this area is is non-viable and non-recoverable. It turns out um, that's not always the case. And he, uh, so he showed in a JAMA article that uh, uh, patients with less than 50% scarring do have increased uh, uh, regional wall thickening in systole uh, following revascularization. Moving on, uh, another thing that uh, cardiac MRI is also capable of is uh, employing a technique called phase contrast imaging, and this allows us to not simply look at uh, uh, look at uh, um, uh, visually the flow th uh, going through the plane or within a plane on a, on an imaging slice, but um, but also being able to quantify the amount of blood flow going through the aorta, quantifying volumetrically the LV and RV stroke, uh, stroke volumes. Using that information, we can actually uh, help resolve different cases, like in, in the case of mitral regurgitation. Uh, this uh, patient came in with discrepant echo and, uh, echo and uh, angiographic data, and so the decision was made to do a cardiac MRI on, on this patient. And if you look at the cines, you'll notice that uh, there's quite a bit of a mitral valve prolapse, if you pay attention to, especially to the, to the four chamber to the four chamber, three chamber, and two chamber views, you can see that the leaflets do uh, move well above the annulus. Um, and then in terms of uh, assessing flows, we found that the aortic flow was well below. Uh, uh, there was at least 50 cc's or so of regurgitation. And not only that, we can actually do high resolution cuts through these uh, clips and demonstrate that there's, uh, that there's uh, involvement primarily in the A2P2 segment of the mitral valve. 
so we can actually localize um, where in the cooptation zone the mitral regurgitation is happening. This is actually made it into the latest guidelines by our very own Dr. Zogby and all. Um, this was just released uh, this year, and, and uh, so cardiac MRI is recommended in such situations for resolving uh, discrepancy in, in uh, uh, valvular uh, regurgitation cases, particularly MR. In terms of paravalvular leaks, um, it, we do have the ability to also not, look, not only look at the flow through the plane, but we can, we can actually look at it in plane as well. And you can see on these three chamber views, uh, encoding initially in the in the x direction, you can see this area that looks. The length of the uh, this. One of these. There you go. You, you can see in this. You can see in this region up here, uh, near 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 the aortic root. Um, there's a, an area of flow that's very suspicious for a paravalvular leak. Doing orthogonal view, um, what we call an LVO2 view, you can also see, you can also see the magnitude image uh, structural information here, and again, the paravalvular leak here. Uh, this patient actually received a TAVR one year ago by one of uh, one of our neighboring institutions, and presented uh, uh, to us with Horstein CHF. Uh, performing the quantifications, we found in his case that he actually had a regression fraction of 50% and the decision was made to, to go in and intervene on this patient um, given his significant paragraph for leak, which you can again see on cross-section cross here involving, uh, involving the um, anterior portion, the superior portion here. And there has been a working group that's been assembled and a couple of years ago they did recommend uh, cardiac MRI uh, for, similar, uh, uh, for similar reasoning for helping out discrepant cases. Keep in mind that cardiac MRI does tend to overestimate, um, tends to uh, um, underestimate um, uh, regression of volume compared, uh, regression of volume uh, um, severity compared to echo for whatever reason. Uh, moving on, we do in, enjoy a, a strong referral base from the congenital colleagues, uh, primarily from uh, uh, Dr. Huey Lin and company. Yep, here we get a little complex. And this lady actually presented, uh, was referred to us uh, with uh, findings of pulmonary hypertension, unexplained right-sided enlargement on uh, cardiac MRI. Um, so this wasn't, so um, not cardiac MRI, on echo. Uh, and it was surprising because echo did not see this, um, but you can clearly see on these cinnies that she had a very large secundum ASD. This subsequently, um, we also performed quantification showed that there was significant QPQS shunting, and this uh, assisted the congenital, our congenital heart colleagues in planning uh, um, ASD closure in this patient. This is another patient who was referred to establish care with, uh, doctor, with uh, our congenital colleagues here, and uh, had a congenital repair at birth. It was found that uh, um, on cardiac MRI, we didn't know what kind of surgery she had, that her pulmonary vasculature, her pulmonary venous system, actually looked a little unusual, looked uh, very abbreviated, and turns out when we got her op report, she had total anomalous pulmonary venous return um, that was repaired uh, one day into birth. But what was missed at the time of birth was also this odd uh, left atrial to pulmonary uh, venous system shunt. Uh, so this was picked up um, by our cardiac MRI techs and uh, I believe we're monitoring this for now, but uh, we had the additional advantage that we can actually set phase contrast uh, slices through this and, and uh, determine flow uh, through this through the shunt. Now, keep in mind that to, uh, a lot of these studies use Gatlin contrast, but we can do a lot of, a lot of study without. But uh, if you want to do certain certain images with uh, gadolinium contrast, uh, renal insufficiency is a contraindication, especially when the GFR is less than 30, because uh, of the risk of nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. That's a FDA black box warning. But uh, despite that, uh, um, there is the off-label use of ferromoxetol uh, in renal insufficiency patients, and uh, provided they don't have laboratory evidence or or imaging evidence of hemochromatosis, we can go ahead and give them fer uh, ferromoxetol and, produ uh, um, and produce a, a, a pretty uh, reasonable MRI. This is a, a patient who was found to have a, who was found to have a, um, a disease in his left, and I don't think it projects well here, but he does have a left calf uh, uh, runoff stenosis. 
In terms of uh, um, another technique we use in uh, MRI, we perform a technique called time-resolved angiography. So whereas uh, we can get high-resolution images uh, with, with uh, breath holes, we can also produce uh, time-resolved angiography where we can actually sample over and over again in time uh, 3D volume sets as the contrast is transiting through the, through the patient. And then from that, select a 3D data set that, that we can supply the surgeons to, to uh, perform further, further imaging. On this particular patient, you can actually see uh, evidence of a small, small endo leak that, that fills late around the aneurysmal sac, this region here. And this, uh, so this patient had a, an endo leak that, uh, um, uh, that would then allow the surgeons to decide, uh, uh, based on the imaging exam, to go ahead and, and perform closure. We, all, we can also do post-contrast uh, th uh, 3D MRI. So not only can you see the angiographic uh, uh, luminogram, you can also see the surrounding tissue structures and get a sense of the surrounding um, clot that she has in her residual aneurysm, as well as the endo leak. We can also supply uh, dynamic information. So obviously MRI can perform cines. And, uh, and so we work very closely with a vascular surgery colleagues to assess uh, um, dissection cases, especially where the intimal flap is involved. So we can actually see the intimal flap, as you can see here, in, um, with a, a great, um, uh, great uh, uh, intimal uh, flap mobility, severe. And you can see it's actually compromising the celiac and, and uh, as I may here. A, a little bit with dynamic obstruction. In the same patient, you, we can also image, uh, this is showing a, a renal involvement as well, so the right renal artery and left renal artery. Um, moving on to future directions, uh, our, we have a very, uh, a very close relationship with an engineer here from Siemens, Panraj, who provided these images. And this is showing an example of where one of the MRA data sets uh, that we provided was loaded in to plan to plan uh, um, angiographic uh, views for, for intervening on this patient with uh, aortic and uh, iliac aneurysms as well. And you can see he's, he's set quite, uh, quite a few data points. And uh, he's, noted, he's going around looking at the registration points and then helping plan the viewing angles, uh, uh, viewing angles that will be used in the angiographic suite. And this is uh, kind of high in the sky right now, but this is a, a collaboration with uh, North, uh, Northwestern, uh, Dr. Markle and his group, where we're actually employing a, 40, a new 40 flow techniques that allow us to visualize flow in three dimensions and across time. The hope is that for the interventionalist is that, uh, that we can actually model these flows and then uh, allow a, an interventionalist to, to uh, per perform a virtual intervention and see how that alters the flow dynamics as well. Thank you for your time.